This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. So this is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Dominic Swintoski. I'm the owner of Trout Bitten, a fly fishing guide, and the author of TroutBitten.com. So today we're ready to talk about reading water, seeing a trout stream, recognizing the currents in a river that hold trout, and having the confidence to target them. Uh, My friends are here with me to share some of their best tips for reading water. And then uh, we'll get into the philosophy of what I call cherry picking or full coverage. That is really the speed at which we cover water. How fast do you move from one place to the next? And what are the merits of hole hopping or trying to efficiently cover every likely piece of river that holds a trout? Uh, There are a couple different ways really to approach your time out there. And it's helpful to think about the best ways to use it. Uh, But before we do the introductions, uh, I want to thank everyone again for all your support for this podcast series. This was a back burner project for me. Uh, For many years, I focused intently on building the article content uh, of Trout Bitten, adding the pieces of the puzzles of fishing dry flies, throwing streamers, and getting deep into the techniques of presenting nymphs. Then with the encouragement of my friends whom you'll hear in a minute, along with the urging of readers and subscribers, I decided to make the podcast launch my summer project in between guide seasons. And it's been wonderful. Uh, This has presented another chance to be creative, uh, but more importantly, to share ideas with people like you, uh, like-minded anglers who love fly fishing for where it takes us, for what it teaches us, and for everything it gives to us. So thank you, and thanks to the companies who are supporting this podcast, uh, because this is also the kind of endeavor that needs financial backing to succeed. Cheers, everybody. All right, let's meet my friends. Here is uh, my buddy Josh Darling, father of three, owner of Wilds Media, and a guy who's both taller and stronger than the average American male. Hi, Josh. Hey there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You you are a bigger man. You are. Uh, Josh, here's your question. What's more important, streamer size or streamer color? Mm. Streamer. Uh, That's a good question. He likes it. Josh likes it. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to go with streamer color. That's it. You're gonna, not going to tell us why. <laughs> Will you? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, all the, all the streamers that I fish are pretty natural colors. Yeah, me too. And and they seem to to do better. You know, hmm. I'm not going to give you guys that much on that. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. When people talk, I, I'll say you know, yeah. I'll, I'll say I'll say that I prefer smaller streamers. Yeah. You know, maybe an inch and a half to three inches max. Yeah. And I don't usually fish anything bigger than that. Right. And so, you know, if we're going to stretch it out farther than that, then I'd say size matters a lot. Mm-hmm. But for the for the variation in my fly box, I think that color matters more. Nice. When people start talking about streamer color, I often kind of bring up the to me, like flash is a bigger factor than color to me. Hmm. We know what we mean by flash, um, you know, crystal flash, uh, flash, yep, of yeah. blue, that kind of stuff. Uh, ice dub. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that's important too. Cool. All right. Here's Bill Dell, spreadsheet freak, uh, details guy, (laughs) and explorer of all trout streams. What's up, Bill? How's it going? Good, bud. Hey, uh, how do you organize hooks and beads at your fly tying desk? Oh, good one. I have two different methods. I have a big Joanne Fabrics kind of compartmental thing that's, I don't know, 12 by 6. And so I put that in, put the beads in that, put the hooks in that, and then I'll cut the, uh, the bead size off of the packet and I'll cut the, the, the numbers and the size off of the hooks. Mm. So you don't get lost later. Yes. Yeah. So you keep everything in that one big, uh, plastic Uh, container divided though. I got about four of them, actually. <laughs> I figured you did. Because <laughs> yeah. we've all seen your flies and how many, how you do that storage. Yep. Yeah. I use uh, pill boxes, like seven-day pill boxes. I, I like them with the pre-made dividers. Yeah. If you get the ones with like the dividers that you slide in, like where you need them, mm. the beads and the hooks slide underneath them, and then you get a hot mess. Mm. 
Good point. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, if they can move found, up and down, not good. Yeah, I found that out the hard way <laughs> yeah. when I dropped one. Yeah, lots of that stuff. You uh, start geez. when you start fly tying. You go, hmm, I'm just gonna do this. Ah, eh, this will be good enough. And then all the stuff you start getting. Yeah, you learn the hard way. Hey, uh, here's Austin Dando, wood products expert and Bob Vila wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> Hey now. What's up, buddy? Uh, hey, uh, is it more memorable to catch or lose a big fish? Ooh. That's, that's a, that's that's a, a Bill, question, isn't it? That's a Bill Dell question for you right there. <laughs> well, uh, I'll approach that this way. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost a lot of good fish in my life. And there's one thing that fishing has taught me. It's that you can't lose what you never had. So I've soaked on a lot of memories <laughs> of losses, but I'm going to choose to say those are not more memorable than landing big fish. Yeah. Um, good memories of landing good trout are better memories and more memorable than landing or losing, excuse me, such size fish. There's actually one story I'll tell you real quick about uh, yeah. why I believe that. Um, during my college summers, I lived in Montana for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the rough life you had there. Yeah. Yeah. I lived at the University of Montana there in Missoula. And um, during one of my last summers there it was the last day of fishing. And I was meeting up with some guys that I'd never met before. We just kind of interacted uh, a little bit here and there, yep. kept touch. Um, and I'd struggled all summer long to catch anything bigger than bigger than 20. Caught so many 18s, caught so many 19s, but struggled to break that whiskey mark. And uh, so many 19s. Yes, I got so <laughs> many 19s. <laughs> Once so again, many it's a rough life. Hot. Hundreds, thousands. <laughs> so many. <laughs> Anyhow, so we went, uh, I went with these guys and we fished this new creek. And again, it was kind of the same day where we couldn't break into that 20 inch mark. And it got towards the end of the day and we ended up in this big plunge pool. Yeah. Where they had in the past caught some really large trout. And it was kind of my time to, to do this. It was the last day of fishing in Montana. I was going to drive mm. home to Pennsylvania the next day. Um, Ended up hooking uh, a very heavy fish. I uh, never felt so undergunned in my life mm. with a 10 foot five weight. Just immediate head shaking. This fish was just grinding its face in the rocks is what it felt like. And it lasted about 10 seconds and the fish was off mm. and it was killer. Yeah. Went and sat, that, sat back down on the bank and uh, watched my friends catch some other rising trout in the pool above and was like, guys, I, I can't go out this way. <laughs> it's been right. too good a summer to, yeah. to go home with, uh, like that. So like, give me your seven weight in that streamer. I'm going to get back in there and see if, if something will happen. Mm. And this size of pool, it normally doesn't, you know, with the with trout that big. Mm. But sure enough, uh, another another sizable trout, eight, and uh, we landed a 22-inch brown trout all together. And I will remember that mm. way more than I will ever remember losing the one before it. Yeah. Um, is it because it's bigger though? No. <laughs> but would do you mean bigger than the previous one, or just bigger because it was right. big? Yeah. How big was the one you lost? I don't know. I never saw. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Usually the ones I lose are really, really big, like twenty-seven inches. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and you and you lose about. them just so that you don't have to deal with. No, them. I like to be ethical and release them long, <laughs> yeah. long distance. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Get a look at them, yeah. and then yeah. <laughs> just to look at them, just to know you fold yeah. them is enough. Yeah, yes. for the top cut the hooks fish. off. <laughs> right. But 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 what motivated you the most that day? The yeah. fact that you lost that fish. Yeah. Oh, that's cool though. Good point, yep. Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe memorable is different than what motivates the most. Yeah. 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 The, sure. Yeah. Losing. Yeah, losing is a good lesson for sure. And sometimes you catch a fish and you lose it. I thought I thought we were going to have another oh right the Houdini <laughs> story. I thought it was going to come back again. <laughs> Houdini story. We have a lot of uh, stories about big fish. I guess it's, it's becoming a feature here. <laughs> I also think you have to lose a bunch to learn how to land a bunch, though. Hmm. Oh, I know that. I mean, uh, yeah, I lost a ton, so that's part of the thing. When I finally felt like I had a handle on at least a decent handle on uh, landing big fish, it was during the cicadas. I've told you guys the best fishing I ever had in my life was uh, when the cicadas were on, well, what, 13 years ago here. Uh, it was just really one big fish after another. So many 18, so many 19, so many, <laughs> so, many. <laughs> so many, so many. But no, that's when I was like, oh, well, I'll fight this one faster so I can get the next one. That's what it, really what it comes down to, you know, fighting them hard.
If you'd have had a spreadsheet, you could tell us how many. Yeah, but, you know, I didn't have a counter or spread. I needed an assistant. I had so many. That's true. Still wouldn't have been yeah. as many. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Trevor, do you feel left out? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. All right. Here's Trevor Smith. Yep. Uh, Renaissance. Afterthought. Yeah. Here's Trevor Smith, Renaissance man who's uh, been just about everywhere and done a little bit of everything at least once. Uh, get to know Trevor and he's full of surprises. Uh, still surprised. Oh, you did that? Oh. But then I heard something the other day from Trevor. Sort of bothered me. Uh, so here's your question, bud. Hey, Trevor, what's wrong with cold cuts? I mean, what do you have against lunch oh, meat? Oh, man. I hate lunch meat. <laughs> what's I hate cold, cold cuts. cuts. I hate Doesn't like cold lunch sandwiches meat. Doesn't in like general. It. Yeah. I think it, I mean, every, I don't know. This is, I, I, when I was very little, I decided I was not going to eat sandwiches. <laughs> and I, I really, I didn't deviate. I've not deviated from that my whole life. I mean, I will, subs are a little different for me. Like the bread on subs is different. There's something different about it. But like lunch meat and just like sliced bread from the store. I all just, sandwiches? Like PB&J uh, off the table? We're all confused by this. Yes. I don't like PB&J. Oh. I like hot food. I think oh. it comes down to the fact that I like hot food. So I would, as a kid, I would make, uh, it's honestly how I learned to cook. Because my mom would be like, well, we're having sandwiches for lunch or some, whatever. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, I'm making macaroni because it's hot <laughs> and I like it. Oh, oh man. So, now, now, what, now, what if it's a toasted sub with lunch meat on it? Oh, that's great. I like hot. Uh, hot sandwiches are great. I'm, I'm good with that. Cold cuts, cold sandwiches, not a fan. I don't understand. So it's temperature. It's not, it's not actual yeah. food. It's it's a more of a temperature thing, and the temperature thing comes down to a texture, texture. thing. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. I'm willing to admit it's a little bit neurotic. What if you left it on the dash for a little while, warmed it up? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> nope. All I right, don't like that. <laughs> All right. Yep. I did, I mean, it's, I'd rather eat nothing. It, it's salty. <laughs> it's bad for you, but delicious, and it comes in a hundred varieties. <laughs> There's pickle yeah. loaf. No. There's everything. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I had to stop eating so many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Right. I really did. Mm. I was eating, uh, I mean, I was, really was eating six, seven a day. <laughs> no, a no, you weren't. No, I'm not, I'm not messing with you guys. <laughs> He's Look, telling the I'm, truth. I'm really not messing In with college? you. In yeah. college? Yeah. 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 What was, well, what even was after college, <laughs> it was not that long ago that I stopped eating them. Yeah, that'll get your calories in. Yeah. Was it the taste? I love the taste. What's the what's your That's, peanut butter? What kind of peanut right, butter? Yes. <laughs> well, so here's here's the thing: is I I grew up on all natural stuff. My mom wanted me to be healthy, mm -hmm. and uh, and so when I got to college, I bought Jif and loved it. And, yeah. Is Jif not healthy? Yeah. Is it not natural? No. No. It's not the grainy natural oil separates to the top stuff. <laughs> you gotta get the brown. That's what I grew up with. Yeah, the brown yeah, wood. The, yep. Yep. Yeah. That's what I grew up on. Well, that's why you're bigger and stronger <laughs> than the average male. No. You're raised. I, sure. Good stock. Good stock. <laughs> Started with good stock and finished with peanut butter. Health, <laughs> healthy peanut butter. All right. Lots of peanut yeah. butter. All right, guys, let's take a quick break and we'll come back with some of your best tips for reading water. Fulling Mill is the world's leading producer of flies, fly boxes, hooks, beads, and tippet. Known for their barbless hooks, they have many of your favorite trout patterns tied barbless. Not only that, they feature patterns from anglers like George Daniel, Pat Weiss, Josh Miller, Joe Goodspeed, and many others from around the world. Every pattern is backed by the 200% fulling mill guarantee. If a fly isn't up to the highest standards that you expect, they will replace it with two that are. Stock up at FullingMill.com or ask for their flies at your local dealer. So I guide 100 days a year, and the longer I guide, the more I realize the things that hold fishermen back. I see the same habits, the faults, and insecurities in anglers all the time. And often I feel the same questions that come up from a genuine confusion about fly fishing. In truth, all the fly fishing education out there can raise real concerns from anglers. We're a pretty analytical group on average, and I notice that fishermen are sometimes paralyzed by their doubt. Too many questions, chipping away at the confidence that we all need to succeed. So the best way to read water is to get out there and fish a lot. Um, there's no substitute for time on the water, uh, with an unstoppable will to learn, too. But many of the best anglers I know grew up with some obsession about moving water. I spent endless hours building rock dams and floating things down currents of the small no-name stream near my parents' property. Uh, there were no fish to be caught there, uh, but I surely learned a lot about how water moves 
and flows around structures and against its borders. However, plenty of anglers get a later start too. Uh, one of the best fishermen I know is a master in a kayak, and he teaches paddling classes. He took up fishing much later in life, but he reads water and understands currents better than anyone I've ever seen. That's the truth. Um, reading water then is a skill to be learned intentionally or almost by accident. So among the hundreds of tactical articles on trout bitten is a full category for reading water, where each article addresses one facet of this skill, uh, kind of like we're about to do here. So search for that category on the website and you'll find a lot of supporting content. Uh, reading water is something we can all improve upon, always, by sharing tips and by understanding how our friends look at the same piece of water, we can see the stream in a whole new way. So guys, let's go round robin here and each of you offer one of uh, your best strategies for reading water. And, and they all have to be brilliant and groundbreaking pieces of advice too. You got one, Trevor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how brilliant it <laughs> I is, know. but... And mine's going to center on on a feature of water that I like to look for in riffles. Yeah. Um, and riffles, as you guys know, are the bug factories of our streams here. Yeah. Uh, they're characterized by kind of mid-sized substrate that's fairly consistent in size, lines the riverbed, and creates kind of a particularly high gradient, shallow kind of look with broken water. Uh, that broken water infuses a lot of oxygen into the stream, and that shallow depth allows the sunlight to penetrate and kind of drive that photosynthetic process that's the foundation for the macroinvertebrate life cycle. And that's obviously what our trout rely on. Science. So this is Ob the bug obviously. factory, right? Science. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. obviously. Such so, science. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I love riffles. I know. Um, so <laughs> while, while most of the water, I think... So when you look at a riffle, it's pretty easy to just think the whole thing looks similar. Yeah. And when you fish riffles longer and longer, you begin to start to see the subtleties of currents within riffles. Sure. And one of the aspects within riffles that I really have come to love fishing is you can call it a pothole or a bucket or a kind of a depression in the stream bed. Yeah. It's different than just one large rock creating kind of a, a you know a shallow flat section behind it. But you'll notice these areas in the stream by looking for kind of a slick spot within the riffle. Mm -hmm. um, it, what I often also see is a little bit of a darker tone to the water mm -hmm. in that section, just because the you know the sunlight's not penetrating quite as deeply. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, polarization in the glasses helps identify these a little bit better. Um, but ultimately these potholes or buckets are valuable to our trout because they allow trout to hold within them using less energy and yet still having that food source of the riffle available to them. So a lot of times you'll find either the, the best fish in that riffle in a bucket like that or better fish than average in those buckets because they really are kind of prime holding spots. Um, I don't necessarily target them and fish them year round, but certainly spring to fall um, they are something that I look for. I don't know. What do you guys think? I love riffles. <laughs> trout, yeah, trout, I know. trout eat in riffles. I think if if they're there, they're mm -hmm. usually there to eat. Dom, you and I were floating a river, mm. and uh, and I remember I was paddling at the time, and you were you were fishing, and I remember you pointing, uh, you point you pointed out a it was a it was a ribbon that was tied to a branch oh, right, right. Ab uh -huh. above a really uh, non-distinct section of, of a riffle. <laughs> and we had to remove that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were like, you were like, Josh, get over there. We're you taking know? that down. And so, yeah, and you took it down and, and I was like, well, why? That, I mean, that didn't look like anything special. Yeah. And you're like, no, that's a, there's a good bucket there. And so in this riffle, hmm. yeah, it produces yeah, good fish. Cool. And it's like, yeah. that's cool. it's like Trevor was describing uh, right there. It's very... It can be very hard to see, and you kind of have to have lower water to really see it for the first time, perhaps. After you know it's or, there, you can often see it in even higher water. But as Trevor described, it's kind of a, a flatter spot, <clears throat> maybe a darker spot. Mm -hmm. I think it's also darker, and you can see it a little bit more because there aren't as many waves there and many, yeah. as many highlights yeah. then coming from the light. A yeah, lot of that's little a things. Good point. I'll just interject real quick. Trevor, you said about having polarized lenses. That's probably the that's probably where reading water starts, and I mean it. Yeah. I mean, about yeah. three years ago, I got my first pair of yellow lenses. That changed everything uh, because yeah. previously I had either gray or amber lenses, and so often we're fishing in dim conditions. And I I'd put those glasses up on my forehead, you know, because oh, yeah. it's a little dark. Yeah. 
But the, anyway, the yellow lenses are great. Even if it's only helping, I don't know, 10%, sometimes it's still helping. It's still good. Absolutely. Yeah. That's cool. The potholes and the riffles. I love it. And I, yeah. I find bigger fish often, sometimes mm -hmm. in those, in those yep. potholes too. Thanks, man. Absolutely. Hey, uh, Austin, what do you, yeah. what do you have? Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about something that is pretty practical and that's just, um, sight angles as it, uh, pertains to the sun and, yeah. uh, any light that's either coming down and reflecting off the water or coming straight out of the sun and right into your eyes. Um, but something we can do, um, and this kind of ties into the, the polarized lens as well, but right off the bat is position ourselves in an advantage to the light, um, so if we cast into a ripple and we can't see what our sighter is doing, yeah. uh, that does not act as an advantage to us any longer. Uh, what we need to do is focus on water that provides enough contrast or less light that we can either adjust our body position or just move across stream or upstream to minimize that. Yeah. Um, you'll notice even if you find yourself in a tough spot just by tilting your head sometimes mm. to the side, to the left or right or up and down, you can watch that glare deflect off those you know, the curvature of your lens. And uh, if if the sun is too bright for your eyes, you know, a trout doesn't have eyelids. It can't close it. <laughs> right. Um, so they don't really love it either. So, uh, you know, always always try to position yourself in a, in a place that offers the most amount of shade or, or not as much direct light. Yeah, especially the brown trout. Brown trout hate sunlight. Negatively phototropic, I think, is the scientific mm. term. Is that right, Ooh. Trevor? Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> Austin, uh, I mean, it. just today, uh, we were fishing left to right, you know, right-handed. We were kind of in what I call a right-handed section of stream. And the guy, I, I was guiding, and the guy was very comfortable fishing that way. And then he said, well, let me hit that piece of water on the left. And you just couldn't see it to the left. I mean, the highlights were so bad because the sun, it wasn't in direct yeah. line, but the sun, right. it was just wrong. That angle was wrong. And so I said, hey, let's wade back over to the left and we'll be able to see into the right again. And right. yeah, I mean, that's not necessarily intuitive when you're first out there, you know, but as you fish for a while, you start, you, you one day you realize it and right. we control those angles. If you're on a river that allows you to wade left and right and from bank to bank, you know, use that advantage is what you're saying. Yeah. And think ahead too. If you know, you're going to be on a stream that has by noon, it's, you're going to be in a straightaway. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might not want to be there, plan your day or, or move ahead of time so that by the time you end up at noon, you're in a, a, a turn in the canyon that uh, casts a big shadow across the creek. You know, help yourself out if you can. So true. There are streams around us. You guys can probably think of them. One of them always has the sun. Oh, midday. It's just always right there in the trout size. You know, if it's upstream, it's in the trout size as, as much as it is yours. So yeah. I'll often not fish at midday. Even in fall and spring, um, even, even when the sun is at a lower angle, it's still there. It's always upstream. And, and then other, other of our favorite streams have, you know, 180 degree bends in them. And you can almost always get around, like you said, Boston in the canyon and, and move around. Yeah. And find those advantageous angles. I noticed sure. if I... It's it's not the most effective, but if you uh, if you're if you have your rod and your sighter kind of below you, yeah, and you're looking kind of down at it, it'll take some of the glare off. And so if you're kind of looking into the sun, you can still see that because the sighter's somewhat below you. So you kind of have to position your body kind of facing downstream, but you're casting upstream when you hold your rod kind of at an angle below you, you can see that sighter because you're kind of looking down at it. The same thing can also apply to, you know, with a dry fly, we're talking about sighters and, and tight line nymphing yep. kind of tactics, but it, it applies for a dry fly if you're having a hard time seeing it. Whatever we're looking at. I mean, we need, do we need to see what we're fishing, whether it's on top or we're, we're using a sighter underneath. If you need, to, are you fishing an indie or however you're seeing your line so you can fish streamers well, whatever you're fishing, you got to be able to see it. So I love it, Austin. The angles, man. Find the right angle, the advantageous angle. Find the good angle for fishing. Right on. You know, yep. and, and move your body. Or walk around, you know, seriously. Walk 100, 200 yards just so you can see what you're doing. Hey, Josh, what do you have, man? What's, your, uh, what's one of your best pieces of advice for reading water? Yeah, I've gone back and forth a little bit mm. about what I was going to 
share, but I think I think I'll note the importance of hitting merging seams downstream of rocks. Cool. Yeah, like we all know, rocks break up the flow of the river and create multiple seams. And any angler worth his salt knows, like behind every rock, we should be looking for wild trout. If you're in a wild trout stream, mm-hmm. it's an area that they're going to be feeding, and and we should target it. But like we all hear, we know it's it's deeper than that. Every rock has multiple seams and holding zones for feeding trout. And so when I approach any rock, you know, whether it breaks the surface of the water or not, I'm going to look for two distinct lanes mm-hmm. that form where fast water meets slow water. And so, you know, you've got three really obvious lanes, cool. fast water, slow water, fast water, but then two that are formed where those water types meet. And that's pretty dang sweet. And even yeah. like, mm-hmm. even predictable. Yeah. Because the the faster water is kicking up and carrying food downriver. And that's the closest seam of moving water to the trout who are sitting at rest just on the soft edge of that lane. Nice. And so when I'm casting to it, I'll, I'll generally cast, and we've talked about this, Dom, I'll generally cast into the softer side of that. Nice. And then yep. let those flies be pulled into the faster water. And it's... It's a unique opportunity to kind of jump in and out of contact with the flies as well, letting the merging water kind of do what it does, carrying the flies into water that the trout are targeting. Yeah. Again, you're kind yeah. of talking about nymphs right there too. Yeah, but I think it can be it, it can be a streamer thing too. I agree. You can do it with dries yeah. too. If you put that dry with yeah. some slack, yeah. you know, right? And I'll, right, exactly. It depends exactly. on where you land that slack. No, I'm with yeah. you. That, that merger seam, you said predictable. I find that merger seams are my best bet. And if I mm-hmm. had just a couple hours to fish, I might just target the, in, a, in a bunch of pocket water. I might just really, really spend the most time on those merger seams. And now we're starting to think ahead a little bit about to our cherry picking and uh, full coverage idea. That's right. Yeah. I might cherry yeah. pick those merger seams. I love it. So here's mine. Uh, I say look upstream to find the seams. And it took me a long time to kind of understand that even water that seems featureless uh, there's there are features, but perhaps those features are upstream. Every water in a river, we're talking about river fishing, I'm not talking about lakes. Every bit of water in a river came from somewhere. Anytime I'm fishing, uh, but especially if it seems featureless, I'll look upstream. And it, it might be 50 feet, it might be 100 feet upstream before I find really where that water kind of came from. Somewhere up there, there's a bend, there's a shelf, there's a rock that is either above or below the water. There's a log. Something creates that seam and makes it distinct. By the time it gets down to me and where I'm casting, it might seem not distinct. It might seem hard to find. But by looking upstream, way upstream, I'm talking about out of casting range. By looking upstream, I'm going to see where that water comes from. And then I just understand more about the seam that I'm fishing. That, That seemed to help a lot of people when I kind of point that out. Yeah, Dom, I definitely agree with that. Uh, One of the times I realized that first was, again, living in Montana and floating some of the really big rivers. And it could be pretty overwhelming where you Uh. look at a vast width of river and think, where the heck do I start? And, you know, it all looks the same. Yeah. But looking ahead and finding, oh, well, there's there's a pretty big drop off there. There's a a large shelf. There's a a crack in the riverbed there. Mm -hmm. And that does a lot where I am. You know, I'll follow that line all the way up to there and see what that does. And that's really what did it for me. Yeah. I should point out too, what we're talking about fishing upstream. I mean, almost, well, I know all of us generally fish upstream and uh, that's another good reason to fish upstream. You're going to know more about the water that you're fishing because you can look upstream to find it. Hey, uh, hey, Bill, what do you have, bud? What's one of your best tips for reading water? Okay. So my tip is uh, look for big fish speed and so Mm -hmm. um i'll say this is not a catch-all be all end all to catch bigger fish sure this is just kind of uh what i've found over the years and so you know big fish get big for a reason they're smart they get lazy they like kind of calmer spots sure and so um if i'm looking for big fish speed i'm looking for a small spot within a large section of river yeah. where the gradient reduces and the river bottom kind of levels off. And often it's just a small, simple, mon- mundane spot 
Um, the only difference between this spot and others is the reduction in current speed. Uh, the depth is usually the same. When I'm looking for it, I, I think of it as taking like a bubble level and laying it on the riverbed. And that bubble level would almost be level. You mean like and a hardwood, so like a level from like, like a carpenter's yeah. level? Yeah, like a four foot carpenter level. And so, yeah, laying that, laying that on the river bottom and it's leveling off. The current gets calm and you can kind of see that by looking at the surface. And so the surface, those riffles and waves on the water will start to kind of level out. And so it's just a nice little kind of cubby hole for a big <laughs> fish to lay and just eat, eat as many bugs as he wants and just kind of relax and, you know, get bigger. Often I find them near the bank because the the banks aren't pressured and uh, eroded over the times from the uh, the main current seam digging out the river over time. And so if you're looking for them, I usually look to the to the banks where you're just a little bit slower spot. And so, yeah. How do you, uh, so you heard Trevor's about the pothole, let's say the pothole in the uh, riffle. Is that similar? How's it different? So to me, it's not a, a pothole means the depth has changed. Gotcha. And so in this, I'm saying it's not necessarily a depth change. It's a speed change. Uh, I like that. So you're, you're looking for that, you know, little lazy eddy that the fish is laying in. You know, if you're thinking of like a hatch, it'd be a hatch where kind of the bugs kind of just pause and sit there for a longer time. Mm. It makes it easier for the fish to sip, sit there and just sip whatever's coming down the river. Nice. So I'm thinking also about uh, Josh's tip. You know, he's talking about finding that merger seam. And it, it, really, one of the commonalities here is that we're always looking for sort of those breaking points, you know, where yeah. where it isn't just fast, 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 but now you have a, a slow piece. And it doesn't have to be super yeah. slow. Yeah. It's some kind of breaking point. I heard once, I don't know where I read it, and it might have been a I don't know if it was a Gallup thing or not, but he talked about, somebody talked about walking speed, that that's what they look for. Mm. You know, if, if the rest of the river is kind one. of flowing at a jog, look for the walking speed. I like that. Yeah, that's a mm -hmm. good one. So it seems like you're looking, Bill, you talked about looking at trying to find where the, where it, the stream bed levels out. Wouldn't, would it not be easier to, to look for, cause you, you said like most of that time is it's near the edge and in softer eddies and stuff. It feels like just just based on your description, it feels like it would make a lot of sense to actually look at obstruction, whether it's the bank or whether it's you know large rocks on the yeah, bank, logs, logs fallen yeah. trees, whatever that is, that's actually causing those eddies. Because if it's just how does how does just a a flat river bottom change the speed of the water? Ooh, so if you're good question, yeah, what I've seen is a lot that that river will kind of you're, you're coming down a gradient and then that gradient will level off. It doesn't have to necessarily have a boulder there to level it off. Think about like if you're going down a hill, you get on the hill and then at the bottom of the hill, it'll start to flatten out. Okay. Yeah. And so you're, you're kind of, you know, there's different levels of it. Like you could, could be a smaller hill you're coming down and at some point it's going to hit like a level phase. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, that's a good similar. way to put it. Yep. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to cherry picking and full coverage. Uh, most anglers probably cherry pick the water they fish. I think that's fair. I often write articles on my laptop perched at a picnic table uh, beside one of the most popular pieces of water in the state. So I've observed the habits of anglers, and not just there. The fisherman's path leads from one prime spot to the next. You've seen it. Um, leaving a good bit of the river, maybe most of it, unfished or hardly fished. That's cherry picking. It's choosing the best piece of water and ignoring the rest. And it can be a great strategy for catching a bunch of fish, sometimes. But sure, there are some caveats to that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Working an entire stretch of water can be harder. But once learned, it might be more productive for a long-term strategy. Uh, full coverage of the river reveals a lot more about trout habits and opens up opportunities to grow into a more complete angler, maybe. And once you catch on to the rhythm of that process of full coverage, uh, it's a fun way to fish, too. In truth, I don't think this is an either-or situation, 
where one strategy is better than the other. I think we all cherry pick sometimes. And then other times we go for full coverage. So what goes into your decision, guys, about how you cover water? What, do you, what are you thinking when you're on the river? Do you choose or do you, do you just kind of happen into it? What are your thoughts? Man, there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that play into this for me. Sure. And we've talked about some of them with many kids and shorter hours. I definitely do cherry pick more. Mm. That's for sure. When I when I was out on Saturday, so we just had our our third kid yeah, two did. weeks ago yesterday yeah. and or today today, and uh, and so Saturday I got to I got to fish and I had about five hours to be out and I cherry picked the entire time, yeah. and and it worked. It was good. It was a lot <laughs> of fun. Uh, other things. To, to say, I, I think that I cherry pick more when I'm fishing with others and I focus a little bit more on full coverage when I have a little bit more time and I'm on my own. Hmm. I don't know what that is exactly, but I think that it plays into it. Really? When I'm, when I'm with other people, yeah, I think, I think I cherry pick a little bit more. Really? And that might honestly, yeah, yeah. I think I, I say it like that because I'm, I'm, I think I'm the opposite. Uh, when there's hmm. other people around, I feel like there's less water available. And so I'll do more full coverage trying to get I mean, the most out of every piece. Tell me. Maybe you're nicer. You're nicer than I am. <laughs> no, you're, 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 ge- <laughs> you're a gentleman. <laughs> you're a gentleman. Yeah, you'll, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I think, I think, I think in a lot of cases I'll want to, unless I'm, like if I'm fishing with one of you guys, it might be more that way Yeah. where I will fish a little bit more full coverage. If I'm fishing with somebody else, especially maybe somebody a little bit less experienced, a little bit less experienced, so then we'll do more... We'll do more. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody that I've fished with if they're listening to this. <laughs> a little bit less experience. We might do a little bit more cherry picking just to just to get them into fish. Oh, I hear that. You know, you know what I mean. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's I think that's kind of what I mean. If I'm fishing with you guys, there's a pretty good chance that I'm just going to be taking what water I can get, and because Dom's front ending me the whole time. <laughs> <Get> and... <laughs> <laughs> First he's gentleman. Now he's now he's a friend. Yeah. yeah. Come on. One thing that sometimes forces me into full coverage, yeah. whether I like it or not, is uh, running into other fishermen. Yeah. So if I'm the first one there during the day, I might start off cherry picking. And then 300 yards upstream, I see one guy, mm. but there's no one between me and him or her. And I may go full coverage and maximize 50, 50. that length of time that I've got and then uh, figure it out after I get there. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a good point. That is true. Yeah, like yeah. we really don't have that much angler pressure around here because there's so much room to spread out. And, oh, I don't know. I, I meet a lot of people who who say, wow, it's it's really nice to be able to, you know, move up to that next spot and heck, skip the next. I'll often say, hey, let's let's skip the next piece of water because I don't do too well in that piece ever, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So we just skip it. And, yeah, having that uh, th- that freedom, Austin, like like you're saying, if you see somebody up there, yeah. You're going you're gonna to try to make more of, of what you have in front of you. Yep. I think weather plays into it a lot for me. So like if I'm fishing a stream after a good rain or something like that, I might neglect to fish some of the heavier water. Oh, good point. You know, and so I'm going to cherry pick the, you know, the channels or the softer water by the banks. Mm. Um, or even even if it's like hot outside and the temperatures are kind of going up and the stream's still fishable from a temperature standpoint, mm-hmm. but I know the trout might be holding in more oxygenated water. Mm, I might yeah. hit the riffles or something like that. So right yeah, on. I think I think weather conditions, time of year, et cetera, play into it a lot for me. And that can make a good case for for starting off with full coverage. If you want to catch a bunch mm. of fish, start off with full coverage and figure out where they're at. Oh, yeah. And then cherry pick that kind of water the rest of the time. Yeah, for sure. That's a good yep. point. Determining yeah, that's a really good like, point. like figuring out where the majority of trout are feeding is a is a job that changes from day to day really you know or hour by mm-hmm. hour and i'll often start yep. with a full coverage approach and then if i start yep. picking up fish in like one type of water regularly i narrow my focus and cherry pick only those spots and it, yeah. it might change later you know and so i'm open to that but yeah, it, it, yeah if the action di- dies down i'll change and i'll go back to that full coverage and then i kind of figure like or i find that oh man everything's eaten in the soft bank seems like uh the 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 big the big fish slow water that the, the bill was talking about, you know, and then I start just targeting that, cherry picking that. It's a good plan, you know, bouncing back and forth between the two. Right on. Yeah, I think I think what we're hitting on here is a really good point to take away from this. Like, I don't. Do you guys ever? Do you ever go out saying one hundred percent you're going to fish one type of water before you get there? Nope. Yeah, I, I don't. 
if I have a limited time, I will. Sometimes, let's say I do have two or three hours to fish. I don't have the time to determine if I'm going to cherry pick or if I'm going to do full coverage. I'm either going in and I'm either going to cover a bunch of water and cherry pick, or I'm going to take my time and really work a couple hundred yards of river. Mm -hmm. That's a better description. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then nope. <laughs> 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 yeah. There, there are lots of times where, where I will decide that I want to fish certain water types to learn something. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. I'm working on a tactic. Often my goal is not to catch the most, most fish, you know? And I, I think that is uh, every angler's first goal is to catch fish, you know, to catch fish. But once you learn that you can do that, then you're trying to catch fish in certain ways or perhaps certain water types. And so, yeah, Trevor, uh, I'll say, you know what, I'm only yeah. going to fish bank seams or I'm only going to fish really fast water because I'm not good at getting my nymph down in it. Or I'm only going to fish riffles mm. on a summer day because the water's low. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fish shady riffles because I, I just think that's going to be perfect. Mm. And like Josh said, maybe I only have a couple hours out there. So I'm going to try to really maximize my, my time. I do kind of feel like, mm, yeah, the older I get, the more I, I'm able to be very focused on a, a plan. I, I used to kind of get out there and just go fishing. I'd hardly think about it, you know. And I wasn't thinking about what my plan was or if I was following through with that plan. And, you know, it worked. That's fine. But something about me has changed, let's say, in the last five or 10 years. And I kind of go out there with a plan, maybe, to target one specific type of water and to cherry pick only that type of water. You know what? Even, on, even if the fish aren't eating in it, I still might only hit that type of water. Keeps you interested. Yeah. Keeps you learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I think the, uh, the comp scene does is they'll talk about breaking down the water into a grid, yeah. the ABC water. The A water is the, the stuff that's obvious, the stuff that looks really good. You know, the stuff we'll go to first. The B water might kind of border that. It's still pretty good, but not as good as that prime run or whatever. And then the C water might be those shallow riffles or um, kind of slower spots off the bank. And I'll think about that sometimes too. Um, you know, let's, let's try to fish that slow moving shallow water and try to not hit my nymphs on the bottom right away yeah. and catch a fish out of it. Um, let's try to break down the river for full coverage in a, a personal challenge to myself. Oh, I love that. That personal challenge. You brought, yeah. you brought up uh, competition fishermen and we have to understand that they are fishing a beat. Uh, they're limited to a stretch of water that I'm going to round it off to a hundred yards. And, but yeah, they need to fish that for what, three, four hours. And yeah, I think two hours thank, or something thank like you. that. Okay. And you better get all the fish you can out of that. You know, so that's yeah. a very much full coverage approach. Yeah. And we have a training tool. It is, it is. And we have the luxury of just moving sometimes to our favorite kind of water. You know, I know I did that oh, for many years and I still do it many times. Uh, that's a luxury though. Like you said, Austin, if there's a, if there's a fisherman a couple hundred yards in front of you, all of a sudden you don't have that luxury. So areas uh, in of the country that have more angler pressure, they're going to be <laughs> they might be more full coverage anglers on a, on a regular basis too. So one of the factors for me, whether it's full coverage or cherry picking yeah. is the trout population. Right. If, if, if I'm going to fish a marginal river and so that it's not necessarily has a high density of fish, the fish are more likely to be in those cherry picking spots. And so those B, C, spots that you're talking about probably don't have fish yeah and so they're not worth fishing and so you're gonna you're they've got fall fish yeah they've got fall fish in them some chubs, <laughs> chubs. maybe some maybe some bass yeah, that's true natives natives these are some things that some of us don't have to think about because you're you're fishing yeah. you know 10 streams a day but yeah you know we're <laughs> i don't i don't <laughs> fish streams very often that don't have a, a relatively high trout density yeah and you, like you have that yeah. luxury yeah yeah. 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 Bill. That's a great point. That's a good Bill. point though, Bill. Yep. Yeah. You guys ever find that when you go out, you'll, so I spend a lot of time thinking about fishing more than I actually <laughs> Virtual fish. fishing. That's what my buddy That's Steve right. calls. That's what Sawyer calls. It. <laughs> yeah. Virtual. He says he's the best <laughs> That's virtual a perfect, fisher. <laughs> That's a perfect line for <laughs> okay. it. Yeah. And I, I'll spend just hours thinking. I'll lay in, if I know I'm fishing the next morning, you know, I'll lay in bed at night thinking yeah. and imagining how the fish is going to come, what run exactly yes. and where in the run it's going to come out yes. of. And so I'll be so excited when I get to that exact spot that I had in my mind and, and I'll 
certainly go into it with the mentality of, of that's where I'm going to catch my best mm-hmm. fish today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's funny. Yeah. I'll point this out. Uh, to me, cherry picking doesn't mean I'm just breezing through a great spot either. When I get to that great spot, I'm taking my time. And now mm-hmm. I'm going to get really great drifts or presentations at each one of those those locations that I'm selecting. And I might, I don't know, if, if I'm in a great spot, uh, I might spend 5, 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes even, depending on the size of the spot that we're talking about. And then I get all the presentations that I want and maybe even I change tactics. And then I'm a, I might move up to the next spot that I want to cherry pick. But at each time I'm there, I'm, like you said, Josh, I'm excited to be there. <laughs> and so yeah. now I'm going to take my time at this next spot. It doesn't mean we're just breezing up, going, 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 going. That said, like Bill, you're the, we will, I think we all agree. Bill fishes faster than anybody that I've, that I've fished with. Oh yeah. And I think that Absolutely. that's a huge advantage. First of all, you have the waiting skill that not everybody has. I think we all, all of us here do, but um, tell us why you fish so fast. I think there's a happy median between cherry picking and full coverage. Sure. You can cover things, you can you can do the full coverage, but do it with less cast. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you can you can quickly cover water and be efficient in it. So meaning instead of me making eighteen to twenty cast into a run that looks really good, I'm taking maybe six or eight cast into it. And then I'm hitting this, you know, the the secondary water that doesn't look as juicy, maybe it's three or four casts. Yeah. And so it's somewhere in between the full coverage and cherry picking. And it's just, it's kind of a, ha- it's kind of a happy median are you, between the two. Are you saying then that you'll fish, let's say secondary water on your way to primary water? Yes. Right, right. That's what I like to do too. So doesn't he trolls. So, I troll, yeah. I just, <laughs> just, I, just, I just throw it out there and I walk across the river. Right. That's how it's done. Just trolling. It might work because it has in the past. It has. It might work someday again. No, that's what I'm hoping I, for. I love it. That, that's what I like to do too because, because what I have my eye on and I think is prime water, I'm going to go cherry pick that next prime spot. Oh, I might be wrong. And it, and the fish might yeah. change, and all of a sudden that secondary water is like Austin called it B and C water. That all this, maybe the sea water all of a sudden is really where they're feeding most. So I'd, okay. it's not very often where I just go, okay, this spot, and I'm going to walk up uh, 50 yards to the next spot. Now I'm going to walk up 100 yards to the next spot. I often fish that stuff in between, like you're saying, Bill. I used to do the kind of what I call tunnel vision, where I'm like, oh, that run looks good, and I'm just going to wade right to it and cherry pick it. Yeah, and so. Through years of experience, I spooked a lot of fish. Sure. And so sometimes it's like, okay, let me take at least one or two casts in that direction. And then you do start to, oh, they are in the seawater today. So then maybe the focus shifts between that primary run that looks so good to that seawater that doesn't look as good, but they seem to be sitting in it and feeding today. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Do you guys ever end up, and Dom, you kind of already answered this, do you ever end up in a situation where you're just surrounded by prime water, where you're in a a full coverage mindset, but everything around you looks like it's to be cherry picked and you get anxious and overwhelmed by it? Well, that's like fishing heaven. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes sometimes I feel that way when I end up in those in those scenarios. I'm like, ah, what do I what do I do? I, I feel like that was the entire Madison River. When I was in Montana, yeah, <laughs> 50 miles of it, right? Yeah, 50 yeah, mile riffle. Yeah. Uh, we have some yep. beautiful water just like that. And I know what you mean. You kind of don't know what to fish next. And you go, oh, where, where should I fish the most? I want to bring this up when Bill was taught, when Bill, when you were talking, uh, you brought up how you can get it, you can fish through that stuff and get it in five or six. You can move pretty fast, get it in five or six casts. I mean, not everybody can do that. It takes a certain skill to get the drifts that you want to get, get efficient, very good and efficient drifts through. I say efficient, meaning effective. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing what we want to see. If it's on a dry fly, we're seeing a true dead drift and it's coming through there effectively. Uh, if we're throwing a nymph, we're seeing, we're getting a good, a good cast up, tucking it in, getting a good strike zone ride and uh, just being very efficient in our cast then and getting the looks that we want in three, four, five drifts in one seam and bang, then we're on to the next one. Uh, not everybody's going to be able to do that. And as I learned 
there's lots of days where I don't have it. And I, and it, it'll take me 10 or 12 drifts to get really what I'm looking for. And I go, Ooh, that's my drift. Oh, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. Wow. They still didn't need it. Fair enough. Now I'll move, but it might take me twice as long on some days when I just don't have it, you know? Now, do you change your, based on your tactic, if you're nymphing, throwing streamers, dry dropper, does that change your, um, approach full coverage versus cherry picking. Yeah, that's cool too. Guys, what do you think? I'd say with, uh, it it's all starts from the beginning again. So if I switch over to streamers when I was fishing nymphs, you know, when I put those nymphs on in the morning, you know, I was doing full coverage to find the water type. Mm. I'm going to do that same thing when I put the streamer on. I'm going to fish all the water types and find which one they might be eating in, and then probably focus my uh, my attention to those areas. I tend to do more full coverage if I fish dry dropper. Just because I want, I don't know, maybe it's more relaxing to me and calming that I just take my time and just work a spot a lot more. Uh, streamers, I feel like I, I, I always fish full coverage with streamers, but it's in a really fast manner yeah. because I can make longer casts and I can cover more water. Yep. And so I'm more, more apt to fish streamers with full coverage versus nymphing. I probably do more cherry picking with. Mm at times that makes sense especially because when you're streamer fishing you don't have to worry about staying in the same seam all the time like you do when you're nymphing you, know, you can cross yeah, it over point. and get it back to you and you know move on yeah so the fly type absolutely matters your tactics uh, what you what you're fishing absolutely matters how fast you can ca you can you can cover water and effectively and efficiently cover that water you can get right through that secondary stuff with a streamer and keep moving. I mean, when I'm fishing streamers, my feet are literally almost always moving. You get right through the secondary water, right to the next, what you think is prime water, and let the fish uh, either confirm or deny that that's actually the prime water. Hey, thanks for the discussion, guys. That, that was a lot of fun. So fly fishing kind of encourages that Zen flow where we aren't really thinking as much as we're doing and enjoying the activity. But I suggest fishing with intention too. Um, as you step into the water, make a plan. Decide whether you'll cover all the water or choose only the best spots. And do you have a good reason to be sure what those best spots are? Hole hopping or cherry picking, if it's working, great. Uh, but when it's not, try revising that plan to a full coverage approach. Use the two strategies in tandem and approach the water with new vision every time you're out. Whatever you choose, be, be sure to come up with a good reason for doing so, uh, because all good fishermen need a theory, right? Um, hey, thanks again to everyone out there for supporting the Trout Pitten Podcast. Uh, let us know if you have questions or suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. Trevor, will you read us out? Yes, sir. Remember, TroutBitten.com is a free resource for all anglers, so dig in and check it out. Navigate through the menus and find what you like. Share it, leave a comment. Use the search page if you're looking for something specific. Navigate by way of the categories and tags too. Thanks so much for listening. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment. That really helps us. Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water. <laughs>